Good afternoon everybody and welcome to my presentation on cell and gene therapy facility design. Today I'm going to be running through the main considerations associated with cell and gene therapy facility design uh, with a particular focus on uh, viral vector manufacturing. So these are the main topics that I'm going to be covering today, which all factor into the strategies and uh, philosophies associated with the facility design. So just to introduce the different areas and different manufacturing processes, so plasmids, which are involved with the transient transfection process, which I'll come to uh, in a, a little bit later on, are manufactured through microbial fermentation. Uh, gene therapy, which is the viral vector manufacturing, um, utilizes largely mammalian, mammalian cells, but can also utilize insect cells with SF9 using the baclovirus um, vector system. And then cell therapy, which is a smaller scale manufacturing process and just focusing on CAR-T as an example here, which is personalized medicine. So to give a current example, uh, obviously we've all lived with COVID for the last couple of years. So just to um, indicate that two of the main vaccines that were developed, the Oxford Biomedica and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, were both gene therapies utilising the um, adenovirus uh, vector system. So this slide just gives an example of the differences uh, in approaches. So in vivo gene therapy is where the medicine is injected into the patient and ex vivo gene therapy is where the cells are modified outside of the patient. So gene therapy in general uses the infectious nature of a virus to deliver a genetic payload to the patient. The introduction of the new genetic material into the patient's cells is the process of transduction. And for in vivo gene therapy, that transduction process occurs in the patient's body after injection of the medicine. And with ex vivo cell therapy, that transduction process occurs outside of the body. So blood is drawn from the patient, the particular target the particular cells to be modified are separated and refined. Those cells, which in the case of CAR T are a patient's T cells, which are part of their immune system, are then transduced with the genetic modification. The modified cells are expanded and then that becomes the medicine which is injected back into the patient in a personalized medicine. This slide gives uh, an overview of the roadmap uh, between the different manufacturing processes and how they interlink. So if we focus on transient transfection, which is the introduction of plasmids into the end stage production bioreactor to produce the viral particle, um, then the plasmid manufacturing is a microbial fermentation using E. coli. The microbial fermentation is a typical microbial process involving upstream, downstream, and the individual plasmids that are manufactured carry certain pieces of information that are required to produce the viral particle. So I'll come to an example of plasmids uh, in a later slide but the, each plasmid carries different information. So one will carry transgene, one will carry the information required to construct the viral particle, and others will uh, provide encoding for an envelope if it's an envelope virus. So the, the, man, the plasmids are manufactured individually and they are inert uh, in when they're initially manufactured and then once they are combined that's where they interact to form uh, to be able to produce the viral particle and that, that combination of the, the different plasmids into the, the plasmid cocktail occurs just prior to transfection of the bioreactor in the uh, viral vector manufacturing process. So the plasmid manufacturing process is a segregated independent process. The plasmids are then provided uh, as a 
GMP starter material to the uh, therapy manufacturing process and then the gene therapy which is produced is either an in vivo uh, gene therapy in which case it is formulated filled and then injected into the patient or it becomes a component which is required for a further manufacturing process such as uh, the ex vivo CAR T. So for example adeno associated virus adenovirus would be typical examples of in vivo gene therapy and lentiviral vector would be an example of the uh, type of vector system that was utilized in CAR T cell therapy. Coming on to the plasmids now, so as I say, these are manufactured by microbial fermentation and the number of plasmids that is used in any particular manufacturing process is dictated by the specific characteristics of the viral particle. So the top two uh, examples here relate to lentivirus. So you'll see from this that there's a second generation and a third generation. They're primarily the third generation is used in, in manufacturing processes, in modern manufacturing processes. So the difference in the second and third generation system is a difference in the viral safety. So lentivirus is derived from HIV, which is obviously a very dangerous virus and for the viral vector to be effective it needs to ensure that it is self-inactivating and non-replicating in other words that the virus itself cannot become active uh, within the patient and it just do it is purely used as a delivery mechanism to deliver the genetic payload into the patient's cells so the third generation packaging system has the greatest level of viral safety and in fact the lentivirus, I will come to biosafety in a, uh, in a later slide, but with the advancements between the second and third generation packaging systems, this has allowed uh, certain regions to downgrade the biosafety level of the lentiviral process. So, and this, this example also gives an example of the number of plasmids. So looking at this, uh, you have four plasmids here for this uh, packaging system. So the first one carries the transgene, the next two carry the instructions for production of the viral particle, and the lentiviral vector is an enveloped capsid. So there's a, an enveloped membrane around the viral particle, which assists with its transduction into the into the host cell. So that's four uh, plasmids that make up this particular viral uh, plasmid cocktail. With the adenovirus, this is three plasmids because the adenovirus is not an enveloped viral particle, therefore it's just the transgene and the packaging plasmids which are required for the adenovirus or as well as adeno-associated virus. So I just want to give an overview now of the types of uh, manufacturing equipment that is used for plasmid manufacturing. So this is a typical, with respect to the unit operations and the manufacturing process, it follows a typical microbial fermentation process. So upstream fermenter, harvest and downstream purification using UFDF chromatography. The scale of operation is typically around the, the 50, 50 liter scale. Some companies, particularly some CDMOs, are looking to use up to 500 liter fermenters for larger batch sizes. So one of, one of the intricacies in the manufacturing process is the harvest stage. So this is an intracellular process. So the product is produced within the cell. The cell it then needs to be lysed in order to release the protein. The product stream from the fermenter is concentrated prior to being uh, lysed, which is typically done in the centrifuge. Most plasmid manufacturing companies are looking to facilitate a fully single-use manufacturing process as far as is practical to improve process closure. 
And at this point, the single-use centrifuges on the market are largely untested when it comes to microbial cultures, which uh, leads to use of stainless steel equipment. One uh, which obviously uh, requires CIP and SIP, which is not desirable if the intention is to provide a fully single-use facility. So one of the alternatives which is currently being implemented by certain uh, manufacturing companies is the use of a TFF system instead of a centrifuge with the intracellular product is then held on the retentate side and the permeate liquid uh, goes to waste to concentrate the product. So this is proving to be an effective uh, alternative for a centrifuge and in replacing the centrifuge with the TFF it is possible then to implement a single-use system to assist with a fully single-use manufacturing train. So then to give an example of uh, cell and gene therapy manufacturing unit operations, so on the left hand side gene therapy, so the in vivo gene therapy manufacturing process can either be a suspension uh, process or an adherent cell process. So a suspension process would use a ticket typical stirred tank uh, bioreactor. The maximum scale that anybody is is utilizing at the moment is uh, 2,000 liters, although transient transfection efficiency can be challenging as, as the process is scaled up. Therefore, the end-stage bioreactor capacity needs to be considered carefully when looking at the transfection efficiency for the particular process. And I will come on to different methods of increasing capacity in the next slide. With an adherent cell process, there is less capability with respect to scale up. Uh, the largest units currently be on the market being the PAL Icellus, which is 500 square meters, or the there is another uh, piece of equipment on the market which is 600 square meters. So this is the adherent cell. There is essentially a donut membrane uh, sitting in the body of this bioreactor and the, the host cells attach to the membrane and grow and the expansion process occurs by the cells developing on the membrane structure. Downstream uh, operations in, uh, in vivo gene therapy are similar unit operations to a typical biologics process, so UFDF chromatography. Largely single use, using hybrid approach is also worth considering, uh, whereby you would have a stainless steel skid and a single use retentate tank or LUA collection vessel. This can help with operational costs and operations in general because it reduces the waste handling at the facility. The skids can be flushed and sanitized with caustic and whiffy from bags uh, so it doesn't, uh, having stainless steel skids does not necessitate the need for CIP systems and the use of this hybrid approach can potentially reduce uh, operating costs because the, the cost of the single-use manifolds associated with these complex skids is very high due to the type and quantity of single-use instruments that are uh, installed in the, in the manifolds. So then looking at the ex vivo cell therapy, so using uh, CAR-T as an example, so CAR-T being a personalized medicine approach, the batch size is always going to be the same uh, because the batch size relates to one patient. And so small scale bench top equipment such as this separation system and this cell expansion system would be used uh, in the manufacture of these processes and then the cell the clinomax prodigy just provides an example of a fully integrated production line for a cell therapy process whereas these pieces of equipment separate the unit operations into individual pieces of equipment so just looking at the capacity expansion so the process that can be followed is either scale up or scale out. So taking the different types of manufacturing process, so with a plasmid manufacturing scale, if you want to scale up the manufacturing operation, 
if you want to increase the capacity of the manufacturing operations that will largely be done by scaling up so that is either adding an additional fermenter of larger capacity into your train or replacing the previous one with a larger one and modifying your inoculum concentration so you can either add uh, an additional fermenter onto your manufacturing train of larger capacity or if the seeding concentration of the uh, end stage process can be varied then the existing smaller uh, fermenter can potentially be replaced with a larger fermenter to scale up the process. So then with uh, in vivo gene therapy the two potential approaches are scale up which would be similar to what I've just said or to scale out. So scaling out would mean instead of going from a 500 litre to a 2000 litre the 500 litre can then potentially seed multiple 500 litres in parallel. The reason why you might scale out as opposed to scale up comes back to what I said earlier about transfection efficiency. So tran the transfection process is one of the main challenges associated with a gene therapy manufacturing process. The uh, efficiency of the process uh, is determined by multiple different factors. These include the ratio of the components within the transfection mixture, the ratio of the transfection solution to the, the ambient incubation time of the, the fluid prior to addition to the production bioreactor and the uh, environmental control of the uh, conditions within the bioreactor during the addition of the transfection mixture. And all of these factors obviously get more challenging as the fluid volume of the transfection solution increases with the increase in capacity of the production bioreactor. And what can be found is if the process is not efficient at the 2000 litre scale but it can be done efficiently at the 500 litre scale then scaling out will increase will potentially increase your yield in that production bioreactor step compared with scaling up to the 2000 litre sub so that that uh, decision needs to be made and obviously that decision feeds into spatial considerations when planning out the facility when looking at autologous cell therapy so using CAR T as an example this is personalized medicine so personalized medicine the batch size never changes it is one patient for one batch and commercial scale facilities therefore need to manufacture multiple patient batches in parallel in order to meet their throughput demand of X number of patients per year. So in this case, we are scaling out. We have a two litre cell bag is an example of the type of equipment that is used for the main expansion step. So in order to have multiple manufacturing batches in parallel, we need to scale out and have multiple of those wave bioreactor systems operating in parallel in the same manufacturing area. The next main consideration that I want to go on to is biosafety level. So when dealing with modified viruses and blood product, the biosafety level considerations can be fairly significant. So just to go through the different areas of manufacturing. So the plasmid manufacturing is BSL-1. Uh, e. coli fermentation is a BSL-1 uh, process and the plasmids themselves are manufactured individually and are inert when they're individual when they're on their own prior to combining into the plasmid cocktail in which case uh, bsl1 is the acceptable level for the uh, plasmid manufacturing process when we come to the cell therapy and gene therapy we're looking the blood product um, being drawn from a patient for CAR T processes so that will typically be a BSL2 environment due to the risk of bloodborne pathogens and the viral vector manufacturing process uh, will largely be BSL2 or BSL2 plus due to the, the risk of the associated with the virus. 
now the biosafety level is reducing so some of the the lower risk viruses such as the deno associated virus can actually be manufactured at bsl1 and in most cases uh, lentivirus is still um, at bsl2 but one example of where the third generation packaging system has allowed the downgrading of that to bsl1 is uh, recently that has been done by the dutch authorities so largely facility design um, is driven by companies own internal standards being higher than the minimum regulatory standard and that brings to typically bsl2 or bsl2 plus so bsl2 plus is uh, is somewhat subjective it can mean different things to different people but largely it is bsl2 at large scale and a risk assessment to determine what BSL-3 measures need to be brought into your facility design. So that can, for example, for a multi-product facility, BSL-2 does not require a VHP decontamination of areas, but the VHP decontamination of areas may be implemented, especially if it's a multi-product facility and especially if it's a CDMO, and therefore that can be an example of a BSL-3 measure that is implemented as part of that BSL-2 plus strategy. One of the other main considerations associated with the, the biosafety level uh, considerations is waste handling. So as I've been through already, these are predominantly single use facilities. So once the consumables have been used in the process, they are then a BSL2 biohazard and need to be decontaminated uh, prior to disposal. So there's two strategies to doing this. One is on-site decontamination, which would typically be done in an autoclave, and another is off-site disposal and incineration. So with the off-site option, all of the consumables would be packaged and contained on site then be removed from site by a uh, waste management contractor uh, for off-site incineration. So the critical considerations here are ensuring that the uh, common areas outside of the manufacturing spaces are not contaminated with their biohazardous waste when the waste is being moved through the facility to the waste staging area. So for the, the off-site disposal of consumables prior to decontamination is really more relevant to smaller scale manufacturing processes such as uh, CAR-T where you have bench scale manufacturing operations. The, all of the uh, consumables can be contained, double bagged, put into uh, biohazardous uh, containers while in the manufacturing suite which can then provide a safe means of transporting the waste through the common areas to the waste staging area and then with the larger consumables when you're looking at larger scale manufacturing processes which may have 500 litre or 2000 litre uh, bioreactors that waste will then need to be decontaminated on site and the the strategy of where the autoclave is depends on what the manufacturing requirements of the facility are. So if it's a single uh, product facility, the uh, autoclave can potentially be in the waste staging area. If it's a multi-product facility and there's other considerations on site, then the decontamination point should be at the exit from the manufacturing area um, so that when the waste consumables are moved into the common uh, circulation spaces, they've already been decontaminated and then they can be moved to the waste staging area as an inert plastic. So all of these factors uh, need to be considered uh, when looking at the spatial requirements and the layout of the facility. So other considerations are operational strategies. These will all factor into the facility design with respect to spatial constraints, uh, utility requirements, how the facility itself is planned out.
So the first one is the buffer strategy. So different uh, requirements are different approaches depending on the scale of your manufacturing process can be to make the buffers on site or purchase ready to use buffers or possibly purchase concentrates and then dilute them in line into the process. So all of these, these different strategies speak to different requirements with respect to your on-site buffer prep capacity, your on-site utility capacity, and also your staging requirements associated with the buffers. Warehousing philosophy is another big one because these are predominantly single-use operations. Therefore, the throughput for the facility will drive the consumables requirements and the, the, the strategy for warehousing needs to look at uh, where the bulk of your consumables are stored. Is there a, a large quantity of consumables start, stored in a, an on-site warehouse, which may be better from a business continuity perspective if you have two or three months worth of uh, consumables on site, but obviously that would require a large warehouse on site, which may, be, may not be feasible. The alternative is to have a just-in-time basis with a, an off-site storage or a third-party logistics company and then you need to ensure that you have regular deliveries to site to, to meet your throughput demands. The other aspect to do with single-use consumables is the kitting philosophy. So uh, the consumables themselves will be delivered from multiple different single-use vendors and then different components will come together to make an overall kit. So for a cell therapy benchtop manufacturing operation, a kit will be relatively small. For a larger scale gene therapy manufacturing operation, the kit will be associated with a bioreactor or with a UFDF system or with a chromatography system and the consumables will be much larger. So with to take through two examples, for a cell therapy operation, the individual components can potentially be kitted together, put into a bag and then that bag um, be staged ready for use and then once it's brought into the manufacturing space the everything is together for each individual uh, manufacturing unit operation um, if that approach is taken then the the kit should be assembled in a graded area that is equivalent of the area where the kit will be used so that they can be kitted sanitized sealed into a bag uh, in the right environment and then the bag won't be opened again until it's ready to use in the manufacturing suite and in between time it can be staged in a CNC area uh, ready for use where it is only the outside over bag which is in contact with the lower grade air. For larger uh, operations the, the, the kitting operation will typically be involved uh, order picking of the different components on a uh, more just-in-time basis but the kit they will require a laydown area deboxing and kitting area and then a staging area within the manufacturing suite where you'll typically bring in a couple of days worth of kits at a time and they'll be used as as required so all of these different um, operational strategies will feed into the spatial requirements and the layout requirements associated with the overall facility design. So in the next couple of slides, I just want to go through a couple of examples of adjacencies for different types of manufacturing operations. So the first one is the plasmid manufacturing, which is a microbial manufacturing facility. This is a GMP starter material, so it is the, the GMP requirements are uh, less, the GMP controls are less stringent. The USP and DSP uh, operations can easily be grade D provided you've got closed processing and with this type of manufacturing process bi-directional flow into the the different manufacturing areas is permitted a more traditional approach to this type of facility design would see the different areas 
fully segregated. So the anoc upstream, harvest downstream, and then bulk filling. But it is a more modern approach to this type of um, facility. Design is to split the areas up into ballrooms, the cell-free boundary being at the harvest area. So all of your USP and harvest uh, operations can be carried out in a single ballroom area. And then the all of your DSP operations, including your bulk filling, can be carried out in the uh, DSP area. Everything, if everything's closed, then the, the risk of uh, cross-contamination is mitigated against. And this is the ballroom approach uh, gives significant advantages with respect to operational flexibility, speed to market. Um, so construction schedules are shorter. Um, commissioning and validation schedules tend to be shorter. Um, and the footprint of the facility can potentially be smaller because you don't have the additional dividing walls and airlocks associated with segregating the different areas. So then on to an example for uh, gene therapy. So for the gene therapy uh, manufacturing processes, you have the consideration of virally negative and virally positive areas. So the traditional, so the host cell expansion uh, phases up to the N minus one step are all typical, uh, more typical biologics process. So you're going from shaker flasks into wave bioreactors, into seed bioreactors, into your end stage production bioreactor. So for the up to the N minus one stage, uh, this is in your host cell expansion area. This is all virally negative operation. Then once you go into your end stage production bioreactor, this is where you do your transient transfection process to produce the viral particle once you reach that uh, optimum cell density. And at that point, you have a virally positive process. So the first uh, example shows a uh, very conservative, fully segregated approach. So your ANOC, which will be typically grade C, host cell expansion and capsid production, which can be grade D, and then separated from your downstream. Um, so you can have your harvest in your capsid production area. The cell-free boundary is then at this point, and then going into your downstream operations, and then the final bulk filling done in in a separate area. So this is a very conservative approach um, and not specifically required. However, one thing that does need to be considered in your facility design is the product manufacturing regime. So if it's single product, then the uh, segregation can be minimized. If it's multi-product, how are you going to manufacture your multi-product? Is it going to be on a campaign basis, so only one product at a time, or is it going to be multiple products in parallel? This will drive your segregation requirements because if it's multiple products in parallel, then from the point where the capsid, where the transient transfection occurs in the end stage bioreactor, once you do the transient transfection step uh, and introduce the plasmids into the bioreactor, uh, at that point, if you're manufacturing multiple products in parallel, then those uh, bioreactors need to be segregated in order to facilitate that method of operation. So the other examples that I've shown here are feasible approaches depending on the manufacturing strategy. So e the USP and harvest area, this all becomes a viral positive area. Then if this is a ballroom and then the DSP, including your bulk filling as a ballroom, this would typically be campaign based or single product manufacture. An alternative approach to that would be to keep the virally negative uh, upstream area and then create a viral positive uh, capsid production harvest purification area. Um, and then into your filling. This layout might be an example of a lentiviral process where the, the up to the M minus one stage is done in here. Uh, the final, the production bioreactor is done here. And then the, the small volume of uh, 
of product which is produced in the in the final ufdf and formulation step might would typically this is rather than bulk filling this might be a, a vial filling operation and then those vials would be taken to the uh, to the car t facility for for use in the manufacturing so this this can be an example of a lentiviral vector process if uh, you have uh, fully closed operations, then the, the manufacturing suites can potentially be grade D, where you do have open manipulations in a biosafety cabinet, such as that would occur within an ANOC suite. Those manufacturing areas should be grade C. Okay, I uh, just want to talk a little bit then about uh, optimization of uh, facilities design. So we use software to model our facilities in order to right size the facility. So this is particularly useful where you have multi-product facility design and high throughput requirements. So Super Pro and Schedule Pro allows the uh, processes to be modeled and then brought into a production scheduling uh, tool where the the processes the back-to-back -back processes are, are are built out in in an overall annual schedule that will show you where you have the bottlenecks it will show you the the optimum number of uh, each of pieces of equipment for each unit operation that is required and will also allow you to right size your utilities and right size your your waste systems so these it will provide a full mass balance full utility balance full energy balance and optimized equipment sizing uh, which then allows you to right size your utilities uh, for your facility so then just to, I want to provide an example on cell therapy facility design. So two example ways of proceeding with cell therapy. So this looking more at kind of uh, CAR-T examples. So two potential approaches are to use uh, podular uh, clean room design or stick built modular construction design. So with the podular clean rooms, these are designed uh, commissioned off site. Uh, they're brought to site, dropped into place, connected up, and therefore the on-site activities uh, prior to startup of the facility are streamlined. They can also be dropped into um, a warehouse space uh, because the, the environment outside of the, the pods uh, it, it is not critical because the clean room environment is obviously created within them. This provides potential for streamlined schedules and increases the, the speed to market. Um, for commercial scale cell therapy facilities, um, an alternative approach is modular construction. So a standard uh, construction build of a facility, which can potentially be set out in modules uh, as are represented here. Um, this type of construction approach does provide more flexibility with respect to uh, future expansion, with respect to the how the, the facility is put together in general obviously this has a slightly this is likely to have a slightly uh, longer um, overall project schedule than using the the clean room pods but it does have that advantage of future expansion and flexibility of operation uh, with with the facility design Okay, and just um, would like to highlight uh, a different approach to modeling for cell therapy in particular. So one of the tools that we have used previously for modeling of a cell therapy facility is uh, Flexim, which is a discrete event simulation software, which allows all the operations in a process to be modeled as a sequence of events in time, which lets you build out a very detailed picture of the manufacturing operations. The reason this is good for something like a CAR T cell therapy facility is because uh, the facility will have multiple manufacturing batches operating in parallel in the same manufacturing areas. These are very labor intensive, so it takes a lot of operators to operate the facility. So building out the modeling the process in this way allows the, the number of pieces of equipment associated with each unit operation to be optimized 
list allows spatial planning within the suites to be optimized because uh, you, you're modeling the operator flows as well as the um, as well as the equipment flows. It allows the uh, all of the operations such as kitting to be linked to production and therefore. Uh, optimizes your storage capacities that are needed for your warehousing and for your kitted kit staging area and it also allows you to model the, the the movement of the operators through the facility so at a shift changeover you will have a significant number of people moving in and out of the the facility and therefore uh, modeling the personnel shift model will allow optimum sizing of the gowning rooms uh, optimum sizing of the airlocks to allow people to move in and out of the facility in the required uh, time frame so that comes to the end of of my uh, presentation thank you for listening i hope that has been informative